hot. I remember to turn it on. <laughs> There's a reason I don't turn that on until I get up here, because I don't think you should have to listen to an old man grunting and creaking getting up the steps. <laughs> so anyway, that's why it's not on until I get here. So uh, let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, another opportunity to gather, to worship you, to glorify you, to lift you up this morning. Lord, we prayed to open the eyes of our heart. And Lord, I also pray that you close our ears to the outside noise this morning, to those things which roll around in our head constantly uh, distracting us from you, that we just remove all that this morning, that we're here to focus solely on you. And dear Lord, that what comes out of my mouth this morning might complete one more pixel in the picture of you that these hearts have been opened for, that these eyes have been opened for. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity and, and hope to honor and praise and glorify you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been studying Galatians. And we're going to continue to study Galatians this morning. We're going to start in chapter 3, verse 15. And it reads, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say in two offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to God's promises? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul first establishes that even a covenant among men, once it's been established, stands firm. No one can annul it or add to it. But that's really not his point. The point he's making is that if this is so between men, how much more certain is a covenant that is made by the Almighty God? God promised Abraham in Genesis twenty-two eighteen 18 that in your seed, and that's out of the King James Version, most of ours probably say offspring, right? In your seed, not seeds, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Paul makes clear that that singular of seed or offspring is used here. Your seed, Jesus Christ, it is referring to a specific descendant, one who ushers in the age of grace. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul the promises previously covenantly established by God. And God's promises can only be fulfilled by God. You might want to remember this as we go through this message, okay? God is the only one who can fulfill one of God's promises. The inheritance offered to Abraham was permanent. It was based, if it was based on a law, it could not be, for it would in part depend on Abraham's ability to keep the law. 
since the inheritance was the basis of a promise, God's promise, it stands sure. In verse 18, the word gave is based on the ancient Greek word, I'll butcher this, kachariste, which is based on the Greek word charis, which means grace. God's giving of this gift was the free giving of grace. It's not hard to find Jesus Christ and the grace that he offers in the Old Testament. It's everywhere. People in the Old Testament were saved by the same grace that we're saved by today. And it's by faith only. God's giving of this gift was free giving of grace. It is also, that word, is used in the perfect tense, not the imperfect. Showing that the gift is permanent. It doesn't have to be reestablished and reestablished, okay? The Judaizers might quote Moses in the law. Paul will quote God in the promise. The covenant with Abraham that was centuries older. A little boy named Tommy one time that was sitting in the kitchen. His mom was making this cake. And this little boy had his elbows propped on the table and was facing his hands, and he's watching his mom put this cake together. And when she's done, mom's going to go clean up because they have company coming, and she tells Tommy, Do not touch the cake. <laughs> that cake is for the company. And Tommy sits there and just stares at the cake. And as he's staring at it, he notices on one side there's a slight imperfection in the frosting. So he decides he'll fix it. He takes his finger and he smears that smooth and he licks his finger and oh my goodness. <laughs> you know what? There's another imperfection <laughs> on the other side of the cake. So he spins it around, proceeds to fix that, and I'm telling you, this boy found more imperfections in that frosting than you could shake a stick at. And when he finally looked at the cake, he's like, wow, did I mess that cake up? Might as well have a piece. <laughs> and after one piece, he had another. And you can imagine when his mom came back in the kitchen, Tommy, I told you not to touch the cake. This story is repeated all throughout humanity, every day, in every household, everywhere. Maybe not with cake, but with our morality, we just can't keep the law. Right? I mean, we just, we just can't do it. It's impossible. Paul spends the last verses of Galatians 3 discussing the law versus the covenant of grace. The covenant that, as I said before, preceded the law by 430 years at least. And a lot of this confusion between grace and the law can boil down to one word. I've used two this morning, seed and offspring. For centuries, the ancient rabbis have interpreted this word as a collective noun. That is a noun that is singular, but can refer to a group of people, okay? Like I could sit here, and if they were here, I could point to my child, children or grandchildren and say, he or she is my offspring. Or I could point to them as a group and say, they are my offspring. So for centuries, these ancient rabbis have tried to interpret Abraham's offspring, especially in Genesis, as the Jewish nation of the Jewish people. Well, you know what? If the promise was to made to the Jews so that they could go out and bless all the nations of the world, how were they doing at that? Not very good. But under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, no, this covenant made to Abraham's seed or offspring is in the singular. It refers to one, 
And this one is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is a descendant of Abraham. That is who the scripture is pointing to. Thus all the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant are fulfilled in the one and only true seed and offspring descendant. So anyone who wants to receive all the blessings of this covenant must come to God through the one seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier in verse 14 we read, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham. In Christ is worthy of being underlined. It's a powerful term. Paul is saying that we can only be in Christ through the grace of Christ. Only by placing your faith in Christ, repenting of your sins to Christ, putting all your trust in Christ, and, be, and being saved by Christ alone. Not by being ethnically Jewish, or as the Judaizers were teaching, uh, adding works to Jesus Christ. This is indisputable. It cannot be added to or subtracted from. It is unchangeable. It is the whole truth. Paul gives support, pointing out that Abraham was saved by faith alone, not by the law. He couldn't have been. The law was not yet established. When God gave the law, it did not nullify the covenant he made with Abraham. One thing it did do was it divided humanity. The law was given to the Jews, so it separated Jews and Gentiles. But when God's Messiah, the offspring of Abraham, came from heaven, he destroyed that division. He tore down the wall and by his grace offered the same salvation to both sides, everyone from every ethnic group, from any background, if they would repent and come to him in faith, they would be saved. And if that is the case, then Paul says, why the law at all? It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Romans 3.20 says, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 5.20 says, And the law entered that sin might abound. In verse 19 and through the rest of the chapter, Paul gives three reasons the law was given 430 years after that covenant. Number one is to be a mirror that re reveals our sinful nature. And number two was to be a guardian until we reach the age of maturity, until we come to Christ. And number three, it is a pipeline to grace. The law was added to show everyone our inability to save ourselves and to show our desperate need for a savior. To display our desperate need for grace. To show that we are a rebellious people against a holy God. The law was given to drive us to a deliverer. To be a constant reminder of our incapability of meeting God's holy standards. God's holiness is demanded in the law. Sometimes we don't look at the Ten Commandments like that, but when you look at the Ten Commandments, there's the attributes of God, the, the holiness of God is just dripping from them. And he demands that. Until the seed Jesus should come. It isn't that the law of Moses was revoked when Jesus came. Matthew 15, 7 tells us Jesus came to fulfill the law, not destroy it. But the law is no longer our ground of approaching God. The law was appointed through angels by the hand of an intermediary, according to Paul, 
the law was delivered to Moses by the hand of angels. They were a go-between or a mediator from God to Moses. The law was mediated, and this means it was a a man was part, party to it, right? I mean, it was a two-part agreement. The promise, on the other hand, is unilateral, and man is not a part of it. You know, as I was studying the, the little phrase, God is one, <laughs> it seems to cause a lot of controversy of uh, people trying to figure out what, what that means in that piece of scripture. God made the promise. God is one. With a mediator is needed when two or more are a part of the covenant. Abraham wasn't a part of it. He was a recipient of it. There were no, you have to do this, you have to do that. It was just God making a promise. Moses didn't need a mediator between him and God, and we don't need one between us and Jesus. Jesus is our mediator. The law was two-party agreement. Salvation in Jesus is by faith and received by a promise. Simply put, the promise is superior to the law. So is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. The law is not something evil opposing God's promise. The problem with the law is found in its inability to give strength to those who desire to keep it. Sidebar, right at this point when I was writing this, I attempted to kill a fly on my computer keyboard with a fly swatter. And it took me like 10 minutes to get back to where I was. <laughs> if you have a fly on your keyboard, just shoo him away to a clear time. Don't smack him in the flesh. It's just, it had nothing to do with his lesson. That's just like... <laughs> if the law could have given life, then it could have brought, most, brought righteousness. But the law of Moses doesn't bring life. It simply comes with a command to keep it and consequences if we don't. But because the law doesn't justify, it doesn't mean that it does not have value. Luther is quoted as, people who are foolish but wise in their own conceits jump to the conclusion that if the law does not justify, it is good for nothing. So how's that work? Because money does not justify, it has no value. Because your eyes cannot justify, pluck them out. Because the law does not justify, it does not follow that the law is without value. But the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin. That by the promise made in faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul paints us a picture of imprisonment. The bars are our sins, keeping us confined. The scripture puts us in prison because it pointed out our sinful condition. So we sit, imprisoned by sin. The law can't help because it put us there. Some might say, well, I'm not a prisoner to sin. Well, there's a simple way to prove it. Quit sinning. <laughs> right? But if you can't stop sinning or have a record of sin, then you are a prisoner of it. There is no statute of limitations on sin. If you have ever sinned, you're a sinner. There is, however, forgiveness. Luther also said, when the law drives you to despair, let it drive you a little further. Let it drive you straight into the arms of Jesus, who says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right. <coughs> Given to those who believe. 
The bars of sin are strong and we can't saw our way through them ourselves. There's no chance of a jailbreak. Instead, an offer is made by the warden himself, Jesus, to simply open the door for you and you can walk out. The only thing you have to do is acknowledge that you're confined and that you deserve to be in the cell and ask him to free you of it with faith that he will. Then when the prosecutor accuses the warden of not being just, the warden simply points out that the free prisoner's sentence was completely filled by the warden himself. So once again, if it does not have the power to save, as we don't have the power to perfectly comply, why are so many Christians so desirable to have the Ten Commandments in public places like classrooms or courthouses? <coughs> Adorning these public places on display along with the cross. Earlier when I said Paul gives three reasons for the law, I'm sorry, but number one is all I can cover today. They kind of cut me off. It is a mirror that when we look at the Ten Commandments and recognize our fallenness, we have to turn to someone besides ourselves for salvation. God gave us the law, not for salvation, but to drive us to salvation's only choice. The one who can eternally save. Mm -hmm. The war against public display of the Ten Commandments and the cross is one of society's greatest tragedies today. The Ten Commandments are to drive us to despair, and the cross comes and redeems us, forgiving us of our sins. And sadly, the evil one knows the power of those symbols better than a lot of Christians and even preachers today. So many are willing to remove these symbols as to not to offend. They don't realize they're actually doing the evil one's bidding. Today, when a woman would go into an abortion clinic, one of the first things they say to her is, you should have nothing to feel guilty about. It is impossible to eliminate the haunting of guilt without dealing with the cause of guilt. God loves us and desires to forgive us for whatever causes that deep guilt inside of us. He does not want us to deal with the symptoms of that guilt. He wants us to deal with the cause. The cross does not deal with the symptoms. The cross deals with the root of sin and therefore the guilt that comes with it. The guilt that the Ten Commandments and the law induce in us is the bad news, and then here comes the cross with the good news. That God can deal with the root of sin. He can remove it by the root. He can forgive us eternally so that we can look in the mirror. I heard a story about this young boy that built this beautiful little sailboat. Any of you ever built a mud puddle sailboat when you were a kid? I did. Took my dad's scraps out of the garage. Man, it was a work for it, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, anyway, this boy took this beautiful sailboat he built and he walked down to the pond that was at the edge of town and he set it in the water. And it just stood straight up, and it was so beautiful. And along come this big gust of wind, there went the boat. He grabbed a stick and started doing this in the water, trying to bring it back, and there was no bringing it back. He just had to stand there and just watch it sail away. There's no way for him to get to the other side of that pond. So he lost his boat. Sometime later, he was walking down the street, and in this town, there was a little store that just sold odds and ends of everything. And in the window, lo and behold, was his boat. 
He said, that's my boat. And he went in and he told the store owner, he said, that's my boat. And he said, well, you're confused, son, it's my boat. And if you want, it's going to cost you $8. And the little boy dug through his pockets and he came up with like seven crumpled ones and a bunch of coins and he, he got the $8. And he said, here, I want my boat. And he walked down the street and he's just, just hugging that boat. He was so happy to have that boat back. Jesus says, I created you. I built you. I fashioned every little part of you. I put every hair in your head. I put every pore in your skin. I did it all. Look around you. You see any imperfections with anybody around you? Too bad. God created them. And he created them like that, and he created them the way he wanted them. And he built these beautiful creatures. And then the winds of sin come, and they take them away. And for a while, we're lost. We're on the other side of the pond. And then here comes Jesus. And he buys you back. He buys you back because he loves his creation. And he grabs you and he holds you. And he never lets you go again. And if you are in Christ, it's just as permanent as God's promise to Abraham. That was going to be my ending this morning, but God kind of laid something on my heart just a little bit ago after talking with people. And you know, there's been change, there's been loss, there's been physical problems, there's been a lot of things that have gone on in the last year or two. And so... I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But sometimes I wonder what he can do through me. There's no great success to show, no glory on my own. But in my weakness he is there to let me know his strength is perfect when my strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in his power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. We can only know the power that he holds when we truly see how deep our weakness goes his strength <coughs> in us begins when ours comes to an end then he hears our humble cries and proves again his strength is perfect when our strength is gone. <coughs> He'll carry us 
when we can't carry on. Raised in his power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. Raised in his power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. is perfect. Dear Lord Almighty, let us lean on your perfect strength. Let us lean on that promise that you made to Abraham, the same promise that we have today, that by faith in you, by trusting you with our entire life, by committing our whole life to you, that we have eternity with you. That the things that trouble us and bother us today are temporary. That we can rely on your strength until such day as we are sitting with you face to face. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
of fellowship and come back in for the second hour. Have a great week.